Arise, take up your pallet, and walk. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Now, most of you probably know that I've worked in the prisons as a psychologist. And, you know, one of the most interesting things that I've noted in my time there is the varied, all of the different religious groups recognized by the Commonwealth of Virginia and all of the varied religions practiced by the inmates. Now, there are mainline Protestant denominations, and there are other groups such as Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses, and then there are pagan groups worshiping the sun and the moon and other celestial and earthly entities. There are Jews and there are Roman Catholics, but for my money, I think the most interesting group of all of them are the Jews for Jesus or the Messianic Jews as they like to be called. Frankly, I, I find these people to be absolutely fascinating. While they openly confess Jesus as Messiah, they also repudiate his church. They spurn all Christian holidays and commemorations, choosing rather to keep the historic Jewish feasts instead. These people, they seek to keep the old law, all the while professing Jesus as some kind of a disjointed Messiah, having nothing to do with the law. But you know, after speaking to these people for the very first time, I realized that I was speaking to modern day Judaizers. And you know, Judaizing was the first heresy of the church. The Council of Jerusalem or the Apostolic Council was held in the year 48 AD. And it's partially recounted in the 15th chapter of the book of the Acts of the Apostles. Now, these Judaizers sought to require new converts to the way to keep the old law up to and including physical circumcision. But the Council of Jerusalem found that that would be an improper imposition to place on the new Gentile converts. Rather, all followers of the way were to aspire to keeping the new law, that is, the law that is Jesus Christ, because of course, as you know, Jesus is the completion of the law. And frankly, after speaking to these Messianic Jews, I realized that they really weren't Jews at all, but frankly were primarily Protestants who were looking for a deeper expression of their faith than their former religions would afford them. These former Protestants went awry because of their lack of knowledge and understanding of the church and its history. And frankly, several other American heresies began in similar ways, uh, such as the already mentioned uh, Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses. They were Protestants who, without the loving guidance and direction of the church, found themselves awash, rudderless, on a sea of heresy. Well, today is the Sunday of the paralytic. And I tell you that that crippled man that we heard about this morning in St. John's Gospel is a lot like the Messianic Jews of today. While they seek healing, they ignore he who can truly heal them in favor of a law that has no power to heal them at all. The Jews for Jesus proclaim Jesus as, mess, uh, as Messiah, and yet they seek to follow the law as their means of salvation. Well, the crippled man lay before Jesus himself at the pool of Bethesda, and he looked at that pool as his means of salvation. Although Jesus stood directly before him, the crippled man actually asked Jesus to help him get into the water. Early church fathers such as Chrysostom and Chromatius saw the pool at Bethesda as a foreshadowing of the waters of Christian baptism. And Chrysostom went as far as to say that the waters of baptism cure diseases of the soul, which really was Jesus' primary concern. And that's why Jesus did not help the paralytic into the water that day. Instead, Jesus caused the crippled man to look upon him as his means of salvation, as his means of healing, and as his means of life. 
And that's why when Jesus turned to the man and said, Arise, take up your pallet and walk, the man was immediately healed. Now, had the story ended there, all would have been well. But of course, as you know, it didn't. The Jews saw the former paralytic walking around carrying his mat on his way home. And they chastised him, telling him that it was the Sabbath and therefore not lawful for him to carry his mat. Now, according to their rigid interpretation of the law, it was forbidden to do any work at all on the Sabbath, including carrying such a small object. They completely ignored the God-given healing that had just occurred. The, the, the crippled man, the formerly crippled man, didn't hesitate at all, but rather put the entire responsibility for his actions squarely upon the shoulders of Jesus. He said, he who made me healthy, that one told me, take up my mat and walk. Well, of course, the Jews wanted to know, hey, who was this guy? But the newly healed man didn't know. He didn't even know who Jesus was at all. The only thing that he knew is that he was crippled, he had an engagement with this man, and now he's healed. Of course, Jesus had slipped away through the crowd, but a day or two later, Jesus found the man in the temple. We don't know this for sure, but perhaps the man had gone to the temple to give thanks to God for his healing. In this case, we don't even know if the man's disease or uh, his infirmity had anything to do with his personal sin or not. But we do know that Christ is concerned for our eternal welfare. And so he tells the man not to sin again, lest something far worse befall him. This was to warn the man of the judgment of God should he continue sinning after he had been healed. After this, St. John simply tells us that the man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And so, what are we to make of all of this? Well, Jesus' life among us was all about something that we've come to know as spiritual warfare. He came to dispel the demons and reclaim his people as holy unto the Lord. And that's why Jesus didn't heal every last diseased person. His concern wasn't so much for broken backs and withered hands as it was for calling his people to faithfulness and saving their eternal souls. Just as in the case of those who waited around the pool with the paralytic that day, Jesus left many unhealed. And yet, he called all to faithfulness, so that on the last day, all would be well. Jesus came to reverse the effects of the fall, you see. He came to fight death, sin, and the role of the demons on this earth. Jesus' ministry among us could be seen as one long exorcism. And one of the major effects of exorcism, as you might know, is that people who are healed spiritually also get healed physically when the demons are cast out. By casting out demons, Jesus cured insanity, seizures, blindness, muteness, lameness, and many other diseases. And this is all because all of the evils of this world are bound up in demonic activity. You see, Jesus came to us to forgive our sins. And to understand that properly, we have to understand that sin is not simply some legal infraction. Rather, sin is a sickness. People who are sin sick are those who have become involved with demons. And people become involved with demons by communicating with them, by spending time with them. And they spend time with demons by spending time doing evil acts. And in this way, the sin sickness for these people can become an addiction, something nearly irresistible to those who are perishing. Well, you know, the old law managed sin, and it managed it through a system of sacrifices and purifications. This was the Levitical law, what we call the law of Moses. 
And these practices temporarily purified Israel from sin, but it never had any power at all to cure sin or to put an end to it. But the incarnation, crucifixion, resurrection, and assumption of Jesus brings death to sin and life to mankind. And so in this Paschal season, when we Christians go around shouting, Christ is risen, what we're really doing is openly declaring our allegiance to the victor of the one who reconquered earth from the demons and put an absolute end, brought absolute defeat to all of his satanic enemies. And so understanding that, we have to ask, what does Jesus expect of us then? Well, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. That's what we're told in 1 John 5, 3. Jesus calls us to live a life of covenant faithfulness with him. And this means that you and I and every last member of mankind has to do one thing, and that is switch sides. We have to leave sin and death for the brighter shores of faithfulness in life. And I'm afraid there's no way to sugarcoat this, my friends, but when we sin, we show ourselves to be of the devil and in league with Satan. We all know that we're called to repentance, but do you realize that repentance is really nothing more than the abandonment of the demonic? And that sounds pretty easy because after all, who in this crowd wants to be demonic? but it's simple, but not easy. Because true repentance is about far more than following the 10 commandments that you find in Exodus 20. Just one example is that God forbids all sexual immorality. Sexual immorality is linked everywhere in the scriptures with idolatry. And idolatry is all about pleasing ourselves. Idolatry is all about cooperating with demons instead of simply being obedient to God. All forms of sexual immorality are idolatrous. God proclaimed that sexual relationships are blessed only within the bounds of holy matrimony. And holy matrimony is, in spite of what you might have heard on the internet, nothing other than the lifelong union between one man and one woman. Anything other than that is to follow our own desires and to be in league with Satan and to ignore God. And so what is what is demonic is not exhausted by this topic of sexuality, but sexuality is probably the perfect example for our very confused and sin sick times. And so if we are to belong to Christ, we must repent which is to say that we must join ourselves to the angels in serving God and our fellow man. Christ's expectation for us is that we follow the law of love instead of the law of selfishness. And we begin to receive the benefits of God's blessings as soon as we begin to love and obey him. Doing the works of God means being like God. And God has revealed himself to us as love. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. So we're told in 1 John 4, 16. But beyond everything else, to love God means to worship God. And all true worship is based on sacrifice. Under the old law, the sacrifice was made with the blood of animals, with grain, with drink, with wheat cakes, or some other food. But the sacrifice was always made in the form of food. And so to worship God means to have a meal with him. But under the new covenant, the sacrifice offered by Christ and given to Christians is called the Eucharist. In the Eucharist, we share a meal of God with God. And in doing this, he makes us his family. The Eucharist is the very heart of the new covenant. And in it, we become sons of God, equal to the angels. St. Luke 20, 36. Loving God means devotion to worship, to prayer, to almsgiving, and seeking him out and dedicating every part of our life to him. 
In addition, of course, we're called on to love and to serve our fellow man. And so this morning, the morning of the paralytic, my question for you is this. How many Christians do you think are living the life of the paralytic before he was healed? How many Christians do you think are living as if they're Messianic Jews? If you examine yourself and you find that you are not somehow living a dynamic relationship of love with God and man, then that means that you know that you have to make a change. And making that change means switching sides. It means turning around. It means metanoia. It means engaging in spiritual warfare by simply leaving the demonic behind for the angelic. So don't think that following the old law is somehow equal to being in loving communion with God, following the rules and doing all of our disciplines, which are very good, are not ends in themselves, but rather serve to bring us into loving relationship with God. And you know, relationships are hard work. They take effort, they take self-sacrifice, and they take love. And all of these things, thanks be to God, and this is the very good news, all of these things are the things that Christ has offered to us. All we have to do is to respond to Jesus by reaching out and taking his hand and accepting his love. God doesn't expect us to be good looking, smart, successful, or anything else other than being lovingly faithful. And so if you repent, you're baptized, and you're lovingly faithful, then you will live. But if you decide to live by the law, just going through the motions and following the rules, then you will die in your sins, and you will spend eternity with your demonic friends. Thankfully, that hellish end needn't be yours or any one of ours. So take the hand of Christ. Be healed and live. In God's name, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen.